So hi everyone. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I'm Greg Minchinski, coming from Synergy Slovenia, and now uh, you got like a nice introduction in what one can do with Earth observation data and all these programs. And probably I was invited to share how this works in practice, right? Um, with our company being an example of this sort. So um, before we went into space, we were actually already an established company, about 30 people uh, from Ljubljana, Slovenia, and we were working in two verticals. The um, large-scale turnkey solutions uh, to support agriculture procedures and land administration. These were more or less li large uh, governmental systems done uh, on demand, and we, we made this for countries in Europe and Africa and Asia. And uh, basically, they were not related to space at all, right? They, they were like this kind of uh, re registers and then parcel identification uh, and land cadaster and so on. Uh, but then uh, we had a pro uh, project in Ghana where we built this kind of system for, like, to, for them to maintain their uh, uh, administration data, land administration data. And when we finished with the system, we realized that they don't have any data, right? I mean, uh, that's ki kind of typical in these uh, um, uh, programs that they build a system, but they don't think about the essentials for it. And um, I mean, that was obviously something that we wanted to address because without data, the, our system is useless. And that was just at the time when uh, Sentinels were launching and we were, I mean, everyone was promoting it, how cool they are. We did know that the resolution of Sentinel is not good enough to, uh, I don't know, identify a parcel, but still there is, uh, you can still identify that there, are, there is a build-up area and it was definitely something, whereas they didn't have anything at all. So we said, look, let's, let's give it a try, let's try to get this in a, in a Ghana system. And we approached it the same as everyone else uh, uh, did at that time, right? Oops. Um, so they... Ah, coming back. Uh, so we went to the open hub, we went to the area, we selected the area of interest, we found the image, we downloaded it. It was kind of a couple of gigabytes of data to download. And then we waited. It takes a while. And then you get all these files. And we were looking at how we, what do we now need to do to actually get these files into something that is presentable. Uh, we, we struggled quite a bit because we were not experienced in space. And then finally, we had an image, right? And this is just one image. Whereas we wanted to make a system that would uh, update the data every few days, as the Copernicus promises, right? And we simply realized that the technology that was available was not uh, uh, suitable for this kind of use. And then being a software company uh, full of engineers, and you know how engineers are, they always believe that they can do things better than that, uh, anyone else have done before that. And typically, this doesn't work uh, well. But in this case, actually, it did, right? So um, what, what happened is that we created uh, a service, Sentinel Hub, which basically provided an API to get access, a harmonized access to all these data so that one could simply embed it in the application like what we were building. So uh, instead of downloading, the process now was the following. So you went to your favorite GIS application, whatever it was. Uh, you you um, copy-pasted the URL of our API, and then voila, you had an image, like in that in a couple of seconds. This was uh, the, the, basically the replacement of all these steps that I was showing you previously. And if you wanted to get an image in some other, other area, you simply went there, and the data was there as well, and you could zoom in to your, to, to, to your location of interest. And then if you wanted to get the data from the past, you simply configured the date that you would like to get the data, and again, the, the image was there. So it was really a, a significant improvement to the, the process. And then what we did then is that uh, uh, when we had this technology in place, we created a Sentinel playground, which was a sort of, it still is, a Google Maps, but providing access to Sentinel data. And it provided the interactive and fast uh, access for anyone. It's free service. Uh, and they, they were able to go and just explore and play with the data, play with different bands, and so on and so on. And this is where our business really hit off because once we made this data easily accessible, people started to use it, and then people did crazy things with it, and then, you know, slowly it built up. So now we had additional vertical uh, to our two of them, uh, which we, we call space vertical, right? Uh, that being said, this vertical actually became to be the most important one in our company, now generating about three quarters of all of our revenues. Uh, we grew our company by 
two and a half times. Since then, we opened another office in Graz with the help of ESA Business Incubator Center. And so now we basically create our business on top of the subscriptions for Centel Hub, white label deployments, and the uh, creating added value services on top of it, right? And just to use this as a promotion, if somebody is up for the adventure, we are hiring, so please contact us uh, if you're interested. So what is Sentinel Hub? For those who don't know about it, I suggest that you simply go uh, to Google and, uh, and Google EO browser. You'll come to the application. You don't even need to register. You go to your favorite place in the world. Uh, you search for the latest imagery that is available, and you just look at it, right? Uh, and then if you want to uh, go a bit back, you can go, let's say, a couple of months in the past or maybe a couple of decades in the past, right? Uh, and you can make some sort of processing so that you extract the information that you'd like to get, uh, in this case, uh, what was the deforestated area. And then once you're happy, you can simply have it running and you can, in, in, you can see how our um, world is changing through time. Ah, I see that animated GIFs are not working. Sorry about that. Anyway, so... Uh, the EO browser is not our, I mean, the EO browser is not what we sell, right? EO browser is free application, uh, and it's a showcase uh, um, of our services, as well as the tool which raises the awareness of the Sentinel data, and, and all, all the satellite data in general. What we do sell, what is our business proposition, is actually an API, the API that powers your browser, but that, that can also power any other application. And it can power the machine learning procedure, which basically consumes most of our uh, services. Then uh, the other applications, like people build precision farming application on top of it, or they can just be used for visualization. And the data coming uh, from Central Hub uh, are basically analysis ready data. And this analysis ready is something that depends on what kind of use case you have. Some people would want to get the original reflectance value, some people would want to get NDVI, some would want to get it as an image, some would like to have a time series, right? So the point is that you can get this data through one harmonized API through which you get access to all different kind of uh, um, the Earth observation, actually other missions as well. Uh, and it takes like a couple of seconds or even half a second to, to get the data. The beautiful part is that uh, uh, we provide access to full archives of, let's say, most or most relevant uh, uh, missions in the world. Sentinel, Landsat, Modis, even some commercial data. Uh, I, I mean, all of this is like 50 petabytes of data. If you would want to have uh, this at, at your place, it would cost you quite a bit. And we put an effort that this is always up to date, so you always get the latest information available. In terms of the business model, it's basically pay-per-use. So it starts with a couple of tens of euros per month, but then the more you use, the more uh, it will cost. But generally, we designed our business model that if you wanted to do this by yourself, you would probably pay as much or more just for the IT infrastructure uh, uh, on your site. Now, if you take into account also the cost of development and the maintenance of this system, it should be a no-brainer that you rather go to this API because you get everything that you need and you can focus two steps uh, uh, further up. And when we made this uh, um, system and it, it became operational, people start to use it and we, I mean, the, the business is steadily growing, we realized that uh, by only providing pixels, we only provide this amount of ad, uh, added value, right? If we try to extract the information out of these pixels, the added value suddenly grows significantly. So we started looking into that, and obviously machine learning uh, um, is the, 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 the way how to do that. But when we started a few years ago, machine learning in Earth observation was kind of designed in a way, ah, you look at the phenology curve, like, I don't know, NDVI of a specific pixel, and then you know if it's this kind of curve, it's corn, if it's this kind of cor uh, curve, is wheat. This is how people were addressing the, the, the classification. But then uh, uh, we always try to do things systematically, and when we looked at the data, Ah, here it's working, just here it's not working. Uh, when we looked at the data, you see that it's not as simple, right? I mean, the, the, uh, um, the data and the reality is way more complicated than just a few curves. And so we try to, to address this in a systematic manner. And another thing that we notice is that there, is, there are a ton of tools, machine learning tools available, open source, like done by Google and Amazon and uh, uh, the other than, than Facebook and alike that they're really good, and they're also good at the image recognition, but they are fine-tuned for cats and dogs and faces, not the complexity of multispectral and multi-temporal satellite data. 
So what we did is that we created a um, Python package called TLearn, which kind of bridges the gap between these two, right? It gets the earth observation data into something that fits well in the, uh, um, in the, the TensorFlow, as an example. And we, uh, we made it open source because we believe that if it helps us, it can also help the others. And on the way, we realized that there are some other tools that we can build to make these procedures even simpler. Um, like, if you want to create machine learning features, uh, you would typically want to, do the, to remove the clouds, then do some gap filling and harmonization, and then you would cut this into chunks so that you can feed it to TensorFlow. So we created a service where you can configure what you would like to do, and then you, you define the area, and you just have it running. And we'll process the continental scale, if you like, in a couple of hours, and we'll deliver the data to your uh, object storage so that then you can take it on further on uh, and, and, and process it in the machine learning. Some people prefer to work with the time series rather than with the pixels uh, because it's simply simpler and for some uh, um, uh, use cases it works as good or better. And we created a similar tool where you can provide hundreds of thousands of polygons and again you configure what you'd like to do and you just have it running and then you read the, the results. Simply to make the whole process more uh, systematic, faster, uh, more efficient and simpler. And while doing all of this, uh, we, um, we, we, we realized that the, the things that we are learning are actually helpful for community as well. And I mean, it would be kind of natural to say, ah, oh, let's keep this for ourselves because then we are smarter than the rest and you know, it's a competitive advantage. But we realized that if we share this experience, we are actually growing the whole market. And because when we are growing the whole market, some of that will actually come to us uh, to make use of the data. And we realized that it's better, both business case as well as the, for the society that we try to be open. So, um, yeah, we put a lot of effort into writing our lessons learned, uh, uh, open sourcing our software, which is well used, uh, in order to, to, to really make this, the, the number of users working with remote sensing as large as possible, because the data is really, really valuable. Now, when uh, we made this data so easily accessible, then you got users from different backgrounds, different interests, different uh, um, experience, who went and used this data, and I mean, they did really cool stuff which we, we would never thought of by ourselves, right? So it's, uh, we learned that it's always better to make tools for others to use rather than trying to do uh, something specific uh, just uh, to try to address a specific use case because then you are limited. And so the, the, the system grew, and we, I mean, we now are processing yeah, half a billion of requests a month. Uh, in terms of the volume, we basically process 100 times the land mass every, uh, every month for the users, right? So it's not just kind of processing that we do just for the sake of processing, but rather this is something that our users are uh, requesting us to do. Uh, so we have about 1,500 payable users, 200,000 uh, freemium users, uh, and basically the system is, is really, really well used uh, on the world scale. Now on the way, we did break some other people's uh, um, businesses and workflows, and some people were not too happy about that, but this is the, 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 the price of the progress, right? You cannot stay at what you're working on. But wh while making the, the, uh, the system more uh, accessible and the data more accessible, we made it possible for lots of others to, to, to do things that previously were not, were not be possible. So now we have hundreds of, of papers that are basically uh, referring to our tools. And then you have some crazy stories, right? I mean, here you have scientists who used our tools to search for penguin poo in Ant Antarctica to basically find new colonies, which cannot be found by, I mean, you cannot see a penguin in Sentinel data, but you can see their poo, right? And so they were able to just use these tools and, and, and get some science done. Or this crazy story of a person who used EO browser uh, to geolocate the photo that the lost hiker sent to his friend. I mean, he was not using uh, the Galileo, so it, he didn't have the uh, GPS tag on, but he just sent this photo. And he was using your browser and the recent Sentinel data and was able to geolocate where this guy is sitting and send the search and rescue team to, to kind of uh, uh, find him, possibly saving his life. 
So, um, what we learned on this way, first of all, is that Sentinel data, I believe, really is a game changer. I mean, it all started with Landsat. Uh, we have to be very thankful to USGS. We started this open data policy uh, uh, of Landsat. But then Sentinel came uh, with, the, with the data that are of really, really good quality and uh, of the detail that is actually useful to make a business application. Not just research, but you can actually make an application on top of it. And I, I, I mean, we kind of see that it revolutionized the world because now suddenly you have orders of magnitude more people using this data, building things on top of it. Next thing that we learned is that there is just too much of data to process this like on the, uh, um, on, on the manual basis. You cannot download everything to your computer. I mean, you can, but it will be slow and it will be useless. So you always have to define the procedure in a way to be, uh, um, to, to, to be able to run on a small scale and then ex extend, uh, and that you can, you can run them in a cloud-native way, uh, that you can repeat them. I, this is super important because so much of research is done just to the point of having one result. And then if you want to make use of that result, for some other thing, it's just simply too cumbersome or too slow, and then nobody does it. If you make a procedure that you can simply run in many places, then you can actually see how good the results of that science are. So that, that's, that's very, very important. And people do really interesting things, like that's an example of a Hendrik Fischer, who um, use Sentinel data to detect trucks. I mean, again, Sentinel with 10 meter resolution is not detailed enough to detect individual vehicle, but he used this rainbow effect to basically detect moving trucks pretty accurately. And so he was able to take the data, uh, the image, and identify how many trucks there are on that picture. And the, the result is actually useful. And even better, this was uh, um, a result done within kind of a crowdsourcing exercise that was organized by us uh, together with ESA, uh, which resulted in not just this, but several other algorithms, which, which were really, really useful. And maybe here to mention, I mean, ESA, and by the way, Horizon Europe is a very similar story. That's a super partner to work with because they give you grants, they give you knowledge, they give you uh, some guidance, but it's also a trap. Uh, if you rely too much on ESA and you just go from one contract to another, you'll actually never build something that is uh, sustainable, valuable, because you'll only focus up to the point of the end of the, the contract. So what we did is that we always went to the project which were very much aligned with what we wanted to do anyway. So basically, we asked uh, and, 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 uh, for the grant to do the things that if we wouldn't uh, receive the grant, we would just invest in this, in this ourselves. I mean, but we were able to get many grants and this helped us to actually grow our business uh, uh, without giving the equity away, which is, is really cool. And I mean, with ESA, you also get this kind of uh, um, the challenging technical partner uh, who actually pushes you in the direction uh, where they believe is right and they're typically uh, quite right in this, in this way. So uh, to, to finalize, I mean, to come here, it took quite some time and quite some effort. I mean, there is no easy way to su 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 succeed here, right? Uh, what we focused on is creating something that actually adds value to the users. Uh, to create something that works. This is super important and sounds trivial, but in space field, you have many prototypes which are just prototypes, right? It ne they never really, really work. And our business pro proposition was, look, use our services because they work. Um, then try not to do everything yourself. I mean, there's so much of things that you can do, and uh, if something is already working somewhere and uh, you can just use it, do that, and then follow, uh, focus on the follow-up steps, because typically they add more value uh, even from the, the, the business case, uh, um, then just this part here. And stay focused. I mean, try not to run too much on left and right, because then you'll never do something that is uh, long-term sustainable. And do something that actually helps the society, right? That's, I think, is important, and this is why the earth observation data really are there. Now, some people might say that there is, a short, that there is an easier way in space, and that's like you just build a satellite, and then you find a venture fund which will give you a couple of millions. Uh, um, and they, I mean, this really happens a lot these days. I can't see how and why, because I think there are just too many of these satellites. Um, but th that's an option. Uh, now, we as our company, we always try to stay grounded because we believe that you can contribute more to the society by making use of the data that is available than just generate, generating more and more and more of the data. So, thank you very much, uh, and looking forward for the panel discussion later on. Thank you.